and uh, Joe Stiglitz. Okay. Uh, well, oh, do you have a? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I've uh, uh, been fortunate to hear uh, three, I think, really interesting uh, presentations, um, most of which I, I, I agree with. Uh, let me, though, try to um, you know, comment uh, about uh, a number of points that have been made and, and then talk about what I see as some of the differences between the Great Depression and the current uh, problem. Uh, the, I, I really do think that there's a lot of similarity between uh, this crisis and uh, uh, many of the previous uh, uh, credit cycles that have been uh, around the, uh, that we've seen repeatedly. Um, there are some important differences I'll, I'll mention, but there are a, a lot of similarities. Uh, of course, in these earlier uh, uh, episodes, uh, they didn't have things like credit default swaps. Uh, CDO, CDO squares, um, and uh, that is one of the reasons uh, why our crisis is a lot worse than a lot of the uh, uh, events that have happened previously. They were very, very non-transparent, and we didn't. Many people didn't understand what was going on, uh, and so the problems got worse before uh, the whole thing uh, fell apart. What What is interesting is that I do think we learned a, a lesson in the Great Depression. There was a whole set of legislation uh, that was passed that Alan talked about. Um, and uh, when Reagan came along, we forgot all that learning. Uh, and so the really interesting p thing is that in the period uh, after World War II, the economy was uh, uh, restarting, that period, the quarter century after that, is the one quarter century in which there was only, I think, one or two banking uh, uh, failures, crises in the world. It's really quite, quite, uh, quite, quite amazing that this is, if you look over uh, uh, quite a long period of time of a couple hundred years, this is an unusual period. And I think it's partly because of uh, the regulation that was imposed. Um, now, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, whether uh, economics is a science or an ideology. Uh, I think uh, I like to believe that I'm a scientist and those who are on the other view uh, are, are ideology, uh, are, are captured by ideology. But I think it's actually true. Uh, <laughs> um, a lot of the, the problems that have been talked about uh, 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 that uh, uh, when talked about, you know, why do markets not fully adjust in the way that the standard competitive equilibrium model predicts? We understand a lot more about why that's the case. We understand why markets don't function in the way that Adam Smith and Aero de Bru, uh said that they ought to to function. Uh, some of it has to do with imperfect information. There, there are lots of other failures that we do understand. And what is so remarkable is that in spite of the repeated episodes and in spite of the multitude of evidence that there remain large groups of economists, in fact, I would say the dominant group uh, in the American economic profession, uh, um, basically continues to work with models which assume that markets work perfectly. And, uh, it, it, you, you know, uh, a remark was made uh, by Robert that uh, um, uh, it's just an episode of, of um, uh, uh, a desire for leisure, this, all this unemployment. Uh, and I've always uh, teased uh, the other view, uh, the other school about that. But I was at a seminar recent, a conference recently with one of the Nobel Prize winners who uh, represents uh, that particular view, and he said it with a perfectly straight face. He said he didn't understand why there was all this to do about the Great Recession. Uh, they're just enjoying a little bit more leisure, just like they worked a little bit more in 2007. So uh, he, for him, he, was, he did not understand uh, what the fuss was about. Now, uh, one of the reasons why I think, uh, um, you know, the, uh, I think Robert was exactly right about uh, how the controversies have remained so similar today uh, to what they were before. 
uh, and I want to pick up one in particular, uh, the role of low interest rates um, and the extent to which uh, 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 that is the cause of the crisis. Uh, normally, when a cost of an input is low, we think it's a great thing. Uh, you know, what firm would complain? The reason I lost money is because my workers didn't charge enough and they charged me too low of a wage. Now, if you said that, you would be laughed out of court, but that's what the financial institutions are saying. The reason they failed was that the cost of capital was too low and the Fed or uh, China was offering them too low of an interest rate. It's an absurd view. It's if you take the view that financial markets are efficient. But of course, the reality is that they're not efficient. They misallocated capital in a, in a disastrous way. Now, what gives things uh, complexity is that if you look uh, uh, at other countries, there have been countries where high interest rates have helped precipitate a crisis. Thailand had high interest rates because it was trying to sterilize an inflow of capital, cheap capital from from Japan. So you can say, was it the high interest rate domestically or was it the low interest rate in Japan? And that's part of the com uh, of, of, of globalization. Um, but the, the failures in each of these cases is the same. It's the failure of the financial markets to do their job. And the job is allocating capital and managing risk. And they fail that repeatedly. So it is an interaction, in a way, between macroeconomics and microeconomics, but it's the microeconomics uh, that drives uh, the failure. Um, what that highlights is that it's not really the money supply that is the problem in uh, many of these cases, and I don't want to. Uh, it was um, uh, the credit institutions. And uh, I think Friedman uh, and Schwartz uh, and much of that whole tradition have uh, uh, done a disservice by focusing on, an, on money supply. Money is important, but it mainly as it affects uh, the supply of credit. And that's why I, I really uh, think that, that uh, Harold's point about uh, the really more similar, the, the similarity, uh, point out the similarity to the failure of our big banks and what happened uh, in uh, Central Europe uh, is very um, apropos. Um, the, uh, 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 when our big banks uh, collapsed, it, it threatened the um, uh, supply of credit and the whole financial system and uh, with all the repercussions. But it's important to realize it wasn't a particular event like the failure of Lehman Brothers. That was sort of a, a cat that, that was really a symbolic symbol of what had gone wrong before, and that was that there had been lending into a bubble on the basis of collateral, and uh, that's the, the point uh, that was made in the very beginning, the, the way in which this crisis is so similar to so many other crises uh, that, that have occurred. There is one way uh, that, uh, and, and by the way, the complexity of our banks and the size of the banks that have failed is a very big difference in one, uh, between uh, 1929, uh, Great Depression, and today. But a second difference is uh, the role of securitization. Securitization was not really uh, important, uh, anywhere near as important then as it is today. Uh, the model of securitization has really broken down. Uh, that is to say, what makes securitization work were these credit rating agencies that said that these F rate, they, they believed in financial alchemy and that they could convert, that investment banks could convert F rated subprime mortgages into A rated securities. Uh, and if you can do that magic, of course, uh, all other, lots of other things can follow. Well, we know that that particular model is broken and no one really trusts the securities that are being issued. And that has not been fixed, and it's not likely to be fixed very quickly, because the models that were being used have been shown to be flawed. Um, so uh, that's one of the ways in which this crisis is different, and one of the what reasons it's going to be very difficult to fix this, because 
what we've done so far is we've thrown a lot of money at the big banks. We saved the big banks, but the big banks don't do lending. They were really, they actually prided themselves of having moved into the moving business. They said, we went out of the storage business and the moving business. They didn't quite do that because if they had been really in the moving business, they wouldn't have been caught with all the bad garbage that uh, brought them down and cost us hundreds of billions of dollars. So I don't know whether they, I think actually they were partly deceiving us. They were deceiving themselves, but uh, it cost us a lot of money. But the, um, the fact is that these are not the banks that are doing much of the lending. It's the small banks, they're a little bit like uh, the banks of the 29s, but we've let them go. A hundred of them have, dis have died this year. Uh, the big uh, firms that are not even banks, like uh, CIT is at the verge of bankruptcy, may survive, but still not going to be doing as much lending. These are the kinds of firms that do lending to small and medium-sized enterprises, letting them die, or, or, or uh, um, and the securities market uh, is, um, uh, not being uh, 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 re uh, recreated. Um, there's a, uh, a way I was going to say that today is different from 29, and that was uh, today is after 29. Um, and, and history, the nature of history is that it's one, unidirectional. Uh, so they couldn't think about our experience, but we can think about their experience. There's a fundamental asymmetry of time. Well, um, the uh, when you think about that, uh, you would have thought that uh, if we ha one of the implications of that is we've discussed, as we are now, what are the lessons. Um, and uh, that, the lesson, reading Friedman Schwartz and all that, did help motivate throwing a lot of money uh, into the crisis, the liquidity, the fl throwing liquidity. But they didn't ask the question of, what was really important to keep the economy going, and that's this flow of credit. And if they had asked that, they would have restructured the, 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 the rescue operation, I think, fundamentally different from the way, uh, from the way they would have, uh, from the way they did. Uh, they would have focused more on how do we keep the flow of credit going. And a couple of the governments abroad did that better than ours, not with a great deal of success, but do it with a, uh, a little bit more success uh, than us. Um, but we are now uh, beginning to repeat the kind of, of uh, problem that uh, plagued the Great Depression. And I'm glad uh, Alan brought that out because we are beginning to worry about the size of the deficit and that is being used as an argument for withdrawing the stimulus. Uh, and uh, you hear that debate all the time. As people say, well, look at all the increase in unemployment. That proves the stimulus didn't work. That's exactly the wrong question. That's not the right counterfactual, what the unemployment rate would have been if we had not had the stimulus. And, uh, 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 but the stimulus you know, was not perfectly designed but it has clearly made, I think, uh, a significant effect. But the increase of the deficit clearly is uh, uh, going to put a constraint on the ability to maintain that, and I think there is a, a serious uh, risk of a kind of repeat of what happened in 1937. Um, there are a couple of other uh, points I want to make very briefly and then open the discussion. One of the things that that hasn't been talked about in, in trying to, to look at the similarities and differences. Uh, one of the uh, differences is the structure of our economy is in many ways different. They, in 1929, we had much more of a manufacturing economy. Today, we have much more of a service sector economy. Why is that important? Well, that has an important implication for the nature of the labor market. Uh, another. Uh, difference is that in 29 we had a lot of single uh, families in which only one person worked. Today we have a lot more families in which two people worked and that means that when one person le loses their job there's somebody else working. Uh, and today we have unemployment insurance. We didn't have unemployment insurance then. And that means that to a large extent the uh, resilience of the economy is stronger today than it was in 
uh, the Great Depression. Um, would have been stronger even without the unemployment insurance, but is it stronger, I think, in part because of the change in the structure of the economy. But it also means that we uh, are sometimes underestimating the severity of this current crisis and the weakness in the labor market. For instance, the number that's bandied around is uh, that we have only 9.8 percent unemployment compared to the numbers in the Great Depression. But in a manufacturing economy, you are more likely to put every, uh, people out of a job. In a service sector economy, more likely you go into uh, um, part-time work and underemployment. So if you look at the statistics right now, if you include discouraged workers and those involuntary working part-time, um, one out of uh, six people are uh, unemployed. In the 30s, we didn't have disability. Today we have disability and, uh, you know, one of the pieces of advice I give my students is that they lose a job, much better to claim disability than go into unemployment. It's longer lasting, it's for the rest of your life, and it pays better than unemployment insurance. So it's a one piece of practical advice I, uh, I, I give them to my students. Well, uh, that means our unemployment, you know, the disability roles have been increasing very rapidly. The applications to disability have been increasing very rapidly. They're not called unemployed, but they're not employed. <laughs> and uh, so that if you look at it from this broader perspective, uh, I think our, our labor market situation is very serious and likely to get much more serious because uh, we will need to grow at at least uh, three, three and a half percent for the unemployment not to increase. Labor force growth of around 1 percent, productivity growth of around 2.2 uh, percent. If we don't grow that fast, then unemployment is going to uh, increase and uh, 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 there is uh, nothing, uh, uh, very little prospect of our growing uh, at that pace. Final. Uh, comment I'll make is uh, on uh, globalization and, and ways in which it's similar and differing. And I think several of the points uh, have already uh, been made, and I just want to add one, one to that. Um, the point uh, was made of the, uh, the resort to what is called financial market protectionism. Uh, and the effect of that is much larger because of the financial market liberalization that occurred before it. So particularly in developing countries that had opened up their markets, this financial pr market protectionism is having a very big effect and will have a very big backlash going forward on, on views about global, globalization. Um, the one uh, point I wanted to uh, take up is uh, the, glo ro the global b imbalances. I don't think the global imbalances cause the crisis. Uh, I, as I said, I think it has to do with uh, the inadequacies, the failures of our, of our financial markets. But uh, I think if, the global, if our financial markets had performed be uh, better, we would have had a crisis eventually from the global imbalances. They just didn't have a chance to fully uh, 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 work their way through. Um, but the global imbalances are having a very big effect, will continue to have an effect on keeping our global economy weak. Um, one of the reasons for the global imbalances is that uh, we mismanaged, the international community mismanaged the economic downturn of 90, uh, the global crisis of 97, 98. Uh, the IMF came in and, and countries lost their economic sovereignty in effect and the IMF uh, converted downturns and recessions, recessions and depressions and countries said they had to be self-insured and the form of self-insurance is uh, build up of reserves, uh, precautionary savings, you can call it the paradox of thrift and it uh, had the, uh, ha has uh, the predictable effect of reducing global aggregate demand. What is interesting is that now, I, I was at the Istanbul meeting of the IMF uh, a, a week ago, and there's broad consensus now about the, the, this problem. 
Uh, there is not yet consensus about what to do about it. The IMF would like to tell countries that we are now the new friendly or cuzzy or uh, uh, cuddly um, IMF that you can come and trust, uh, but, uh, and we are now willing to be the lender of last resort, stop putting money in your reserves and just trust us. Well, uh, I understand and I wish uh, in, in some sense if, if, if their message had succeeded, uh, it, it would help, um, and they are changed. Let me say, they really have changed markedly. Uh, but uh, the trust isn't there, and you have to trust them not only for di this year or next year, and with Dominique Strauss-Kahn as they had, but also the next guy, and you don't know who that's going to be. So the answer is, uh, the way we've mismanaged this crisis is going to increase, in the broad consensus, the demand for reserves going forward. And that's why one of the, one of the uh, responses that uh, the UN Commission uh, that I chaired and that Jose Antonio was on called for the creation of a global reserve system. And uh, it's an idea that's gotten a, a, a lot of resonance, including from the largest holder of reserves, China, which gives it a little bit more impetus than it otherwise would have had. Um, uh, well, uh, the other big difference is that the world, the, the leaders um, realized, uh, Sarkozy and Brown and eventually Bush, uh, realized that you needed a global response. And uh, they brought them together in the form of a G20. Uh, they uh, haven't really done very much, uh, but they have given each other encouragement to uh, keep up their stimulus, uh, to do something about um, uh, regulation. Uh, they haven't done anything significant about regulation and the structural changes in the financial system, the problem of, I think, too big to fail banks. Banks have gotten even uh, worse. But I think they have made a contribution because I think the continual lecturing each other about the dangers of protectionism have stopped things from getting much worse. You know, when they left, went home from Washington after they first made that commitment, 17 of the 20 went ahead and violated it. Uh, and they passed protectionist, me protectionist measures, most notably the United States. But I think things would have been worse, it could have been worse if they hadn't done that. So I think that that globalization has changed uh, the nature of the response uh, in some ways for the better, some ways for the worse, but uh, clearly uh, the long run, uh, we are in a closely globally integrated economy and it's going to be very difficult for uh, the United States or for other countries to uh, recover without a global recovery, and that means we'll have to address the problems in a coordinated and cooperative way.